these features that are different from the ideal that we're told about does not actually put you at risk for exile. It's like we have to communicate that to our limbic system, to the primitive middle brain. And when that happens, then we can start to love and appreciate the features that make us different. Hi, I'm Eva Clay. I'm a clinical sex therapist and my passion is to help singles and couples have the most amazing, deep, fulfilling intimacy. Hi, I'm Peppermint. And I'm Dusty. And we are a webcamming couple and we've been doing it for the last uh, almost uh, seven years. Our motivation is to show an example of a truly loving, authentic relationship to inspire others to seek the same thing. So today we're going to talk about how to love your imperfect body. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone really who has an absolutely perfect body. And I'd like to challenge even what we call perfect, what we define as perfect, because to me, it's all just a big illusion. And if you're watching this today, probably you've had an experience of maybe not loving your body or having some criticism about your own body. This is a really natural experience in our culture because we do tend to emulate this myth, this illusion of perfection. And so we're going to talk about some tips and tools of how to shift any kind of criticism you have about your own body into love and appreciation. And Peppermint and Dusty, I'm so excited to talk with you about this today. Let's start off with just naming what you notice in yourself and maybe in your community and in your world about body attitude and body image. It's, I mean, it's a huge topic here because I think every single one of us knows the pressure of society and the pressure of media to look a certain way. I mean, look at how many beauty products are sold, especially to women that, you know, our, our hair's not good enough. Our skin's not good enough. We don't want wrinkles. We don't want to gain weight. We got to get the right push-up bra to give us the right kind of cleavage. And it's just, it's, there's never going to be a point where we feel like we've attained that perfection. So I think it's really up to us as individuals to know and recognize that kind of programming and to decide that we don't want to buy into it, to realize that our bodies are impermanent. They're simply a shell for the heart, the mind, the spirit. Mm -hmm. And of course we want to take mm -hmm. care of ourselves. We want to feel like we look our best and we want to feel our best, but it really takes, it's a continuous lifelong journey of loving ourselves completely, accepting ourselves completely, recognizing and acknowledging where we're maybe being a little bit critical and to be kinder, to be more compassionate, to be accepting that there really is no sense of perfect and we are never going to achieve that. So just to be happy with ourselves, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, um, as, a, as a society, it's there's even been more um, over the course of the last, probably I'd say probably the last 20, 30 years, that there's been an increasing even more of that of that physical appearance on on um, men as well uh, and there's also the aspect of financial as well and that adds a lot of pressure and a, a lot of like you know keeping up with the Joneses and I think we all get so wrapped up in trying to keep up with the Joneses that uh, we forget just to be present you know, just to be, you know, conscious, you know, of our, of our, of ourselves. And, you know, really what matters is our, our core. And from there, the extension of that, which is, you know, our immediate, our immediate family, you know. Absolutely. And so I think we all know <laughs> what's going on in terms of, um, cultural and media expectations and the messaging. I want to talk really about the nitty gritty of like, how do we shift this within ourselves? 
how do we move from a critical place into a positive place? And maybe there are some practices that the two of you use or that you're aware of that we can share with our viewers and our listeners. I think two things for me are affirmation and gratitude. Um, affirming that my body is strong and healthy and my body has served me so well in this lifetime and that I feel grateful that I can take a deep breath and that I have eyes that can witness the beauty all around me and that I can move and I can feel good and I can experience so much pleasure through this mm -hmm. body. And so I think it's reminding ourselves of that and just doing you know, affirmations with our partner and telling them how much we appreciate what they do for us and appreciate who they are. So, I mean, the two biggest ones for me are affirmation and gratitude. Love it. I think that uh, also um, it, acceptance of our body, you know, um, you know, we all have different types of body types and, you know, that's something that's been genetically handed down to us through you know, the eons, you know, um, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you kind of got like a, you know, you're built with a bigger, a bigger frame, you know, you, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, accept that, you know, um, you, you know, if, if your hip bones are wider, you're pro you're not going to get that really skinny, narrow frame and to do it when you're having to go in and, you know, like surgically alter yourself, um, you know, is, um, is not keeping in, in step with the core of yourself. So, I mean, you know, accepting who we are and viewing the beauty of who we are, um, is, a is a really powerful tool. And part of that acquiring that I feel is just, a you know, uh, is it, is a daily, is a daily reminder, you know, that, you know, this is who I am. This is the way I am. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that person, you know? Mm. Um, and you know, that just like, you know, I'm five ten. Yeah. I can sit here and go, God, I wish I was six foot tall. But there's somebody that's six foot tall that's either wishing they were shorter or that they were wishing they were taller. So it's this constant, like, I'm not happy with who I am and the way I am, you know, and that goes even towards the physicality of, of even our, our, our genitals. You know, it's like, well, we have people that ask us all the time, you know, like, well, you know, is, is six inches big enough? Is eight inches big enough? Is 10 inches big enough? It's like, well, yes and no. I mean, it depends on who you're interacting with, you know, someone, if you're interacting with a, with a, with a person who clearly can't take 10 inches, then clearly that's not the person that's going to be able to, you know, say that, you know, it's like, so again, it's, but regardless, if you have a six inch penis or a five inch penis or a 10 inch penis, that's what you got, you know? Um, so find, surround yourself with people who appreciate you for you rather than chasing the people who don't appreciate you anyway. Mm -hmm. And even if you do achieve what they appreciate, they're not going to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You bring in some really good points, Dusty, about the male version of body image and that it tends to really focus on penis size and genitalia. And now, because I do have a background in neuroscience, I thought it might be interesting to drop a little bit of science into this. In that, given our media and our culture, it is absolutely normal for all of us to be critical of our bodies. And I'm gonna explain why. And it has to do with evolutionary psychology. So let's look at this from the perspective of our most important primitive evolutionary drive is for belonging. We do not survive as a species outside of a tribe. We don't have enough adaptation skills. We don't have fur, claws, fangs to survive on our own. So in our primitive brain, we are driven to belong. And we have this mechanism in our brain called the negativity bias. 
And this is a, a function of our psyche that always looks for the negatives in any situation in order to help us survive it. So let's say you ate some berries for lunch and the red berries were delicious and the black berries made you sick. You would definitely remember those black berries more than you remembered the other berries because it made you sick. So let's take this concept of the negativity bias and we can apply it to ourselves. Our brain is going to scan our body to look for features of our body that don't fit the ideal because it puts us in jeopardy of not belonging. So just know this, that when you look in the mirror and you feel super critical of your nose, your breasts, your penis, like whatever that is, that that is an evolutionary mechanism at work inside of you. And there's nothing wrong with you for having this experience. In fact, it's completely human to want to look for what might exile you. So I think it's really powerful to know this because we can then start to work with it and the affirmations, Peppermint, that you mentioned earlier can sound more like, I have a big nose and I still belong. I have a small penis and I am still loved. And to remember that these features that are different from the ideal that we're told about does not actually put you at risk for exile. It's like we have to communicate that to our limbic system, to the primitive middle brain. And when that happens, then we can start to love and appreciate the features that make us different. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I thought it was just me being <laughs> hypercritical of myself and looking at the flaws and being critical of the flaws rather than back up a little bit. Look at the whole picture. You're doing mighty good for 50 <laughs> Yes, you are. And your brain is wired. Yes, <laughs> you both are. But your brain is wired to look for the negative. And you can begin to retrain that by actually focusing on the positives. Mm -hmm. So let's say you keep ruminating on some part of your body that you find is different or insufficient in some way. To shift your focus, you actually start to reroute neural pathways to shift your focus onto something about yourself that you like. Now, it could be something on your body or something inside, your personality, your virtues, your character, your generosity, for example, the way that you love, and really focus on that and let your brain fixate on that, and it will start to, eh, 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 over time, reroute that circuitry, and you will no longer be critical of that body part. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I think especially as we age, knowing that our bodies are going to change, you know, I look in the mirror and I see more wrinkles. Um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. So my breasts don't look the same way that they used to look. And so I tend to hyper focus on that and be super critical. Yet, even if I didn't have any breasts, even if my breasts were, you know, triple D's, I would still be the same person inside regardless of what my breasts look like or how big they are, how small they are. Amazing. Amazing. I think that also, I think also that we, um, you know, that sometimes, you know, yeah, the social media, media, um, advertisements, everything else, you know, uh, train us to some degree as far as what we are willing to compare ourselves to others based on. But sometimes we also project that, you know, sometimes we turn around. I mean, you know, somebody can walk up to you and go, oh, you have a beautiful nose. And, you know, like my nose is, you know, I got a kind of a big nose and it's got a broke right here because when I was 12, I dove off of a high dive and hit the six foot zone of the of the deep section of the pool. And, you know, and it's and it's it's no longer a straight line. It's like a hump there. But, you know, we also can sometimes cause others to hyper-focus on, on what we consider to be a flaw. And they didn't even look at it that way. It's like, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're a beautiful person. I really, you know, you're really attractive. Oh yeah. But you know, my cheeks are here and this cheeks down here. This ear is a little lower than this ear over and this ear is higher over here. You know, look at my jaw. My jaw is like this, you know, and you know, we, we sometimes, you know, even though society isn't doing it, 
we then, again, we just get hyper-focused on all the things that we think are a flaw to us. And, you know, again, just accepting ourselves. I mean, you know. Easier said than done. It is easier said than done. but It's it's a continuous practice. Of finding the positives about yourself. And Peppermint, I really appreciate what you said about the gratitude and having gratitude for the body. And and Dusty, I want to make a suggestion based on what you just said, which is so great, you know, about accepting yourself and understanding that we're all comparing ourselves to this impossible ideal. And the suggestion is this to actually appreciate your body for its function, not so much for the aesthetic. So let's say you are critical of your nose, Dusty. Let's take your wonderful example. I love this idea uh, that you gave, like you you dove off the, the board and you bonked your nose and now you have this beautiful bump on it. So let's look at the nose as the function instead of the aesthetic. And what does your nose actually do for you? So we can give gratitude for the nose, for smell, for being able to smell, which is so important, not only for our enjoyment of foods and of life, but also for our survival. Smell is one of our most important senses. Um, And then think about some of the things you love to smell. You know, cookies baking in the oven, (laughs) bread, the smell of peppermint. (laughs) in her neck and, and, um, all kinds of things. So like shifting your approach and your attitude about your body parts from the way it looks to how it functions, I find really helps to reroute those neural pathways. I'm curious if either of you have more to add about that or an example. One thing I'm super grateful about the advent of, uh, adult webcamming and with so many people being their own content producers is it's really shifted that aesthetic from, you know, you used to have a handful of, you know, companies that would produce porn and it would be one certain look and one certain style. Now with so many different varieties of people being webcamers out there and projecting this sexiness and this confidence there's so Mm. much to choose from that it appeals to different people because obviously we all have a certain aesthetic that we like and that we're drawn to and that we're turned on by and there's just so much more to choose from now you know you can have someone who's very round and voluptuous and people are really attracted to that or you have someone who's more you know athletic and you know pixie you're maybe more you know androgynous and there's people that are drawn to that so there's just so much more that can tickle our taste buds right now. And I really, really love, you know, the the websites that are doing camming and the content creators for putting so much variety out there. I mean, for ourselves included, you know, you hit 25 or 28 and you're already (laughs) enough, (laughs) you know, whereas their 40s or their 50s or their 60s are putting some really sexy stuff out there. So it lets us as individuals and as a society to challenge the beliefs is really, well, maybe I used to not consider that sexy, but wow, look at this woman. She's, she's 70 and she looks amazing. And I'm drawn to that and kudos to her. That's, that's really brave and that's really sexy. And so I'm just, I'm so thrilled that we have these platforms to express ourselves. I think also, I was going to say that, you know, owning (laughs) yourself. Yeah. what, What truly is sexy is owning yourself. Delta Burks was, is, is a beautiful woman and she owned herself. You know, um, it doesn't mean that she probably didn't have moments of insecurity and stuff like that, but at least when she was out in public, she owned it. And, um, you know, uh, the same thing, you know, it's like, we, we've all got our, we've all got our insecurities and our flaws, but the difference is, is owning it, you know, um, you know, you can have, you can have uh, two women. One woman is, they're both the same. They're both the same, almost both the same body shape. And, but why, why is the one more attractive? And it's because the one owns her identity. She mm-hmm. owns herself. And, um, uh, and that I think, and same with men, you know, it's so important to just 
own your presence. And, and it doesn't mean you're arrogant. It doesn't mean you, you're, you're egotistical. It just means, hey, this is who I am. You know, I do have a big nose, but hey, I love my nose. I love my facial structure. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that, you know? Um, and I think as we get older, hopefully that is something that we become more comfortable with in our skin, which also translates into our comfortness with, with our own sexuality and with how we please each other as well. You know, that we become love more it. confident. I love it. You know, I, I'm looking around right now. Confident. Sorry about that. But because as my body has been aging, I have been in this mantra affirmation of own it, own it, own it. And so I have little stickies all over my house that say, own it, own it, own it. And so I was, I was looking, I'm like, where's my sticky? I want to show you what's on my wall. <laughs> it's so important. It's so simple, but it's so impactful. Just own it, man. And it can be hard. I mean, it's not, it's not easy to do that. I mean, you know, we can sit here and go, oh, well, just own it. It takes it. It takes some. It takes some work, you know. Um, you know, everything takes some work, you know. Um, but it's well worth putting the time in. Yes. To get to that point, point. and there's lots of tools. So I to love do this it. idea of like just putting on this attitude, and I don't mean like um, faking it necessarily, but owning the parts of you that you love already the inner parts and the outer parts and letting those parts lead and the own it, like the attitude, you know, you mentioned some celebrities like Lizzo is another one who owns it. She owns herself. And there are many that, you know, we could name, but that's actually what becomes magnetic and attractive about them. And I think when we're talking about body image and loving our imperfect body, what's really important to understand is what's actually attractive to people, right? I'm, I'm sure that we've all had this experience of being attracted to someone that might not be like that ideal beauty or that ideal guy or like the, you know, the perfect body or whatever, but still we were so magnetized and maybe we even fell in love with that person. And to understand perfection is not necessarily what's most attractive, that it's the inner light, it's the inner beauty, it's the attitude, it's your inner qualities that are most important. And I think that's a very important pillar of learning to love yourself. I mean, we are aesthetic creatures. Our, our visual, our sense of sight gives us our first level of information. So we're initially attracted to somebody because of their aesthetics, their, you know, their physical traits and the way they look. Hopefully, we move beyond that. Um, I don't remember all the classifications mm -hmm. now, but the Greek forms of love, there's eros, there's agape, there's, you know, sexual attraction and lust. Then there's um, a, a deeper love, there's a familiar love, there's a love for self. And I don't, like I said, I don't remember all the terms, um, but hopefully we evolve through those stages. And yes, we use our sight to be drawn initially to somebody, but when we start to look deeper, we're either attracted more or were repelled by them. You could have somebody who is this gorgeous aesthetic, but their personality mm -hmm. is just rotten. And so they become unattractive to you, even though their body hasn't changed, their personality is just abrasive and vice versa. You could see someone who's like, maybe not necessarily the aesthetic that turns you on so much, but they're just, they have this heartfelt generosity in the spirit that, wow, makes you look a little bit deeper that lets you move beyond. Well, maybe I'm not so attracted to, you know, the way they look, but my God, they're such a wonderful person. I want to be around them. Absolutely. I want to get to know them more. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with having a, a type that you like. I mean, you know, that there's, you know, um, you know, as long, I guess, as long as it's, um, uh, you know, you've taken some time to really evaluate it, you know, but I mean, we all have types, you know, um, you know, and I don't see, I don't see a problem with that also, you know, it's just that sometimes we as individuals mm -hmm. try to start fitting into other people's types rather than just being us and looking for people who appreciate us. 
So it's like, you know, then you start getting into that. Well, you know, if I could just change 10% of you, what, what change 10% do you think I would change about you? And it's like, um, well, I'm happy with the hundred percent of me. Um, so what about the 90% you don't want to change? Why don't, why don't you focus on the 90%? Exactly. Um, you know, or, you know what, that's fine. I'm, I'm still happy with a hundred percent of me. So, you know what, I'm going to seek someone who accepts me for who I am and the way that I am. You know, um, I think unfortunately, a lot of times we start trying to, we start trying to put ourselves into someone else's expectations of what they desire. And then the next thing we know, we do that enough times in relationships mm. and we no longer know ourselves. And um, so that's the reason why it's really important to know yourself, to take the time to really know what you want, know what drives you, what's important to you. And that takes time too. Sometimes it takes multiple relationships. Sometimes it, you know, to figure out what that is, but to really focus on the core of what is it that really sparks me? What is it that really drives me? What is it that mm -hmm. I really love mm -hmm. about myself? I think you bring in a really good point, Dusty, you know? about community, about connections. And again, coming back to this primitive drive for belonging that we have. Now, no matter how social you are, or let's say you're like a little less social, you're more introverted. Um, of course, we all have the spectrum of how much interaction we like, but essentially we are tribal animals. And so what's really important, I find, to cultivate a sense of self-love is to surround yourself with people who appreciate you and accept you as you are. And there's simply no substitute for that, even if it's online, but ideally it would be in person that you have family, or maybe it's not family, maybe it's an organization or a church or a club or anything that you might belong to, even if it's just a couple of friends that you meet with occasionally who really love and accept you as you are. It helps give us that mirror, that sense of reflection of being seen and witnessed and being accepted and having that sense of belonging. And that satisfies a very deep, important tribal drive. I wonder what you guys think about that. Yeah, I think we all want acceptance and we all want validation, you know. And so, like you said, surrounding ourselves with people who truly see us, who truly accept us is, is validating and not necessarily for how mm. we look, yes. but for who we who are on the inside. And, yeah. and trust. I mean, you know, um, you know, with all that said, there's growth too. And, you know, those who truly value us and, and, truly have our best interests at heart um, and that we can be truly honest and authentic with, that doesn't mean that there aren't certain things that we as an individual don't want to grow and expand. Otherwise, we would all just be a bunch of sloths, you know, um, and there's nothing wrong with sloths, but, you know, you, you really can't drive a car if you're a sloth. I mean, you, you, the reaction time isn't going to be speedy enough. So it's okay to also, you know, have the assistance of those that um, help you grow too. So, I mean, there's, there's that fine line of, well, I accept you for, for, for the way you are. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. But, you know, as any, parent knows, you know, you have to motivate your, you have to motivate your children too, to, to grow and to expand. And, you know, and sometimes in relationships, you know, we, our partners help us grow as well. Um, and the relationships that we choose, but again, knowing ourselves mm. is the, is the key to that. Absolutely. I hope that makes sense <laughs> because it, it's a real fine line between that. Uh, you can accept me for who I am and the way I am, but at the same time, you know, I can accept Pep went through breast cancer. Okay. 
I wasn't going to accept Pep saying, I, I, I quit. You know, I give up. You know, that is unacceptable. Um, and because I love her and I care about her, I'm going to do everything I can to support her. So yes, there was moments in that battle that she wanted to give up. You know, like, I, I can't, I, I, I can't deal with this. It's like, okay, well, we're going to deal with this together. So that's, that's part of that. Okay. I know that that's not who you are at this moment. Um, so let's get you back to that person, mm -hmm. um, prior to, and, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that me physically, I'm going to be the same physical shape that I was when I was 20, 25 years of age, you know? So yes, I can go to the gym all I want. I can, my, my significant other can assist me in going to the gym, but I'm not going to be that potentially physical, that physical person that I was when I was 20, 25, but I can be healthy. I can be, I can be in good shape, you know? I can have a strong heart. I can have a strong cardiovascular system. So there is that balance mm -hmm. that we have to mm -hmm. put in there too. Sure. The Taking good care of ourselves. You know. yeah, yeah, for sure. I think in seeking that community of people that support us and love us and see us and validate us, it's also important that they kind of maybe are willing to, you know, point out certain behaviors that are maybe, you know, detrimental to our well-being and say, hey, you know, I love you and I care about you. So I don't know if you're aware of this thing that you're doing, but I'd like to help support you in maybe creating better habits or, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, physical habits or, you know, mental habits. When you see somebody you love getting into this pattern that's, that's detrimental to them, hopefully you can say with a loving intention that, you know, I, I want to help you be the best version of yourself that you can be. And let's, let's get through this. What's at the root of this, like, you know, pattern mm, that's causing you so beautiful here. and let's let's work through yeah. it together peppermint i'm curious about in your journey of recovering from breast cancer and obviously that that's a big kind of threat not only to your life and well-being but also to how you see your body because with cancer your body turns against you right like there's um a, a real attack on the body and so many women have been through this journey and what you've done is very inspiring. I'm wondering if you have a few words to share about your experience. Um, as challenging as that situation was to get through, I think I was in the best possible place to have a positive outcome. One, because of this amazing man sitting by my side um, and how do you, he just loved me and supported me no matter what. And I knew that love was never gonna go away. Um, I had family to rely on, I had friends to rely on, I had community to rely on. So I was in the best possible situation to have a good outcome. I'm also very in tune with my body. You know, I'm, I'm, it, maybe it's a soothing mechanism, but I feel like fondling my breasts and holding my breasts a lot of the time. So I felt a lump when it was at a very early stage and I was able to intervene right away. Um, so fortunately I didn't have to have a mastectomy, a single mastectomy or a double mastectomy. Um, there was a tumor and three lymph nodes removed from the left side, as well as some precancerous cells removed from the right side. So on the right side, they actually removed quite a lot of breast tissue, which I was very surprised at. Um, and anytime you have a surgery that's going to alter your body and leave scars, it's, it's traumatizing. So the initial trauma of, you know, having to keep these bandages on for like, you know, weeks on end until my scars healed, that was shocking. When I first took the bandages off, I was, I was devastated. It was hard to look at myself in the mirror until, you know, the scar tissue kind of softened a little bit and the scars kind of softened a little bit. Um, there's still times when I look at myself and I see that, oh well, God, my breasts are so ugly or they're deformed, or I was looking through some old content um, of ours last night and I saw you know some videos of myself before I had surgery I'm like oh my breasts were so beautiful and perfect then you know so I have to just recognize when I'm getting into that pattern of not loving myself fully um, and again I think it comes back to that gratitude and that information I'm grateful that I'm still alive and I have so much life to experience 
and I'm grateful that I do still have my breasts and I'm grateful that I was able to, you know, keep my nipples and I have sensation in my nipples. So when Dusty touches me or sucks on my nipples, I can still feel that. So it's just when I get into that negative pattern of being critical, mm, I just try to like so important. Come I back think that's the, the theme actually of our conversation today is coming back to the gratitude and focusing on the positives. So before we close out today, is there anything the two of you would like to say to our viewers or listeners? Um, you know, I had my own personal experience, which allowed me the empathy um, and the, the, um, the time that I took for learning self-care, self-respect, um, that then when Pep went through her breast cancer, I could use as an example um, to her and to reassure her, number one, those scars will, will fade. They'll never go away. You know, the, you know, the memory, the, the, the fear of that will always be there, but you can, you know, uh, you can take from that um, experience, you know, yeah, you, you may have some scars and your breasts may not have looked the way that they looked before it, but the woman that you are now, the person that you are now is even stronger, even more beautiful, both inner and outer than you were before it went, before it happened. And you were, you know, you were, you're a beautiful woman, but the power that you vest in yourself to others. I mean, we're talking, you know, Eva was talking about the women who've gone through breast cancer, but one in seven, one in eight will experience breast cancer. So all of those that will experience this in the future. I mean, I'd love to say it will never happen, but you know, that isn't going to happen. Um, to know that you can still be loved, that you, um, that you will pull through it, that people around you love you and care about you, and that that physicality isn't what everyone is focusing on, and um, including your significant other. Um, you know, I lost, uh, I lost my right testicle in a head-on collision when I was 31, 32 years of age. It was, I mean, they had to, they had to surgically remove it. And, um, you know, it was ex extremely traumatic. You know, they, they darn near life flighted me out when it happened. And, you know, when we first started camming, it was one of my big concerns was, okay, how am I gonna handle this? People coming in are, oh, look, Dusty, you, 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 you know, you don't have a, you don't have a testicle. Um, or where's your testicle at? Hey dude, you don't have a testicle. Um, you know, uh, and we're using the more technical scientific term. I can assure you that every other derivative of that, you know, was used. Um, and at first I was, I was a little cautious of it, including, um, you know, even Pep going down on me and giving me a, um, you know, ballet show down there. Um, and then, you know, I was comfortable with it prior to that. Um, but through that, I also, we had people coming into the room and going, wow, Dusty, you don't have you don't have a testicle on the, on the, and let me tell you, it doesn't happen all that often, but it brings up an entire conversation. And one of the most key things of it that that's happened from it is that other people go, wow, you know what? I haven't been intimate for years. This is, these are men, you know, I lost mine in, in an, in an accident too, or I lost mine because of, of testicular cancer or I lost my, or I never had it, or it never descended properly, or I had to have it removed when I was a kid or something, you know, I haven't been intimate with someone because I'm so self-conscious 
I'm so focused on the outer me that I am suppressing people get to know the inner me. And so, you know, Dusty, because of you, you're giving me the confidence to be able to expose myself to someone. I'm, I'm going to, mm. literally, I'm going to go wow. start dating. I'm going to try dating again. Um, and yeah. And so I will happily take once in a blue moon, someone coming in the room and saying maybe something derogatory. If one person comes into that room and goes, wow, you're inspiring me to have the confidence to re-engage, re-engage life, re-engage a relationship, re-engage society, expose myself, let myself shine and be seen. And um, that was one of the really admirable things that, and I would have supported you if you'd said, you know what, I don't want to cam anymore. I would have been 100% in support of you. We wouldn't have cammed ever again. We wouldn't have become, you know, um, we wouldn't have been nominated and won, you know, something that really means a lot to me. You know, why not, you know, uh, uh, best cam couple. But you making that decision to also show others that life goes on post the scars, you know, whether that be emotional scars, physical scars, you know, um, that life goes on and you have the choice. You may not be able to stop from getting cancer, but you can choose how you take the lumps in life and move on and inspire yourself and inspire others. Um, and that is one of the things that I fell in love with you when we were walking up that hill and you turned to me and you said what you said. And I said, Hmm, well, I don't have a testicle. Then you said, touche. And we turned around, we continued walking up the hill yeah. on our second day. So, you know, I am really glad that you stepped outside of yourself and truly evaluated and saw the true beauty of yourself and what you bring to this world, because this world is so much better for seeing that. Yeah. On that date, I basically said, I'm imperfect. You said, I'm imperfect too. And I said, okay, let's do this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. You guys. Amazing. What a great, story and embodiment of how our imperfections can actually lead us to greater love. And it's all about owning it. So thanks so much for your time today, you guys. Uh, I love so much yeah. talking with you and working with you. You're such an inspiration to so many. Thank you for doing what you do and for bringing your whole imperfect selves to the world. And thank you too for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us and having these conversations. I think it's really important for people to hear these things. And your beautiful imperfections. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.